Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and welcome, everybody, to UI Hospitals and Clinics Volunteer Information Session. My name is Jean Reed, and I'm the Director of Volunteer Services here. And I'm glad to see you all interested in uh, working through the onboarding process to join the team here. Uh, you may or may not realize our hospital um, is one of the largest student-managed volunteer programs in the country. Um, and in a typical year, we have nearly a thousand volunteers uh, contributing. And uh, this information session is uh, geared for both student and community. So um, a, a little bit of combined information. Some of the student information might not be totally applicable to the community volunteers that are going to be watching the video, but um, every volunteer needs the same um, competencies and onboarding uh, checklists uh, in the end to get started here. So that's what we're working towards today. Um, we're going to begin by sharing some information about UIHC as well as the volunteer program, discuss some uh, important topics for new volunteers, and finally address your next steps as a volunteer. And um, I'm going to turn it over here shortly to uh, Megan Schick, who I'm introducing as our college student leaderboard chairperson. So Megan's volunteered around 500 hours. Does that sound right, Megan? Yeah. <laughs> um, many of which were served in the SNCU, right? Mm -hmm. Burn trauma unit, palliative care unit, um, on our college student leaderboard, um, and now most recently as uh, our chair, the highest leadership position in our program. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's going to uh, review um, the next section here, some of the basic information that you need to get started. So Megan, take it away. <laughs> well, hello, everyone, and thank you, Jean. Um, and again, we want to welcome you to our volunteer information session. Um, there's a quite a bit of information that we'll be discussing today, but all of the information that we cover is also located in our volunteer handbook. Yeah. Um, so you can go find this document online on our website, and it should be one of your go-to resources um, for all things volunteering related. Um, I will not be going through the handbook word for word. Instead, today we'll be dis discussing um, all of the different things, and you'll be expected to read through the handbook in its entirety um, by the time you return for your first volunteer shift. Uh, we're going to start out by discussing our hospital, our program and mission, and just how are we different from other hospitals or nursing homes where you may have volunteered previously. So University of Iowa Healthcare is an umbrella term that refers to the partnership between UI hospitals and clinics, the Car Carver College of Medicine, and UI physicians. The volunteer services program is a part of the UI healthcare then as well. A little background on the UIHC, we are one of the largest university-owned teaching hospitals in the United States. Um, we provide tertiary or highly specialized care and referral services for physicians, dentists, and community hospitals all over the state of Iowa and in the Midwest. Each day, we serve over 800 inpatients and schedule another 3,000 outpatient clinic appointments. Perhaps 1,000 volunteers a year supplement our staff in providing the finest health care possible to make our patients' lives more pleasant and comfortable. The mission of volunteer services is to improve the experiences of patients and family at UI hospitals and clinics and UI Stead Family Children's Hospital. Essentially, our goal is to provide helpful services in support of our patients, family, and staff as well as to ensure a quality volunteer experience for each member of the program. Like Jean had said earlier, in a typical year, 1,000 volunteers donate 100,000 hours of service in over 100 different placement areas. Perhaps 75% of our volunteers are students preparing for a career in health, health sciences. Approximately 800 of those volunteers are students. Volunteer Services oversees retail businesses and donates hundreds of thousands of dollars to funded programs that benefit UI healthcare, patients, and families. Through our, throughout our program, we have fantastic leadership opportunities, one of which is the Student Leader Board, which I help manage. The board consists of approximately 19 students um, who are volunteer leaders who have strong commitment to service at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. These members are responsible for coordinating more than 800 college student volunteers contributing throughout our hospital each year. 
The SLB member serves as a liaison between volunteer services and the supervisory staff in their assigned area. They are a facilitator and manager for the college volunteers, serving to make the volunteer experience more enjoyable and worthwhile. SLB members attend monthly board meetings, build relationships with their staff volunteer supervisors, coordinate trainings for their volunteers and mentors, and administer the volunteer schedule for their unit. Most volunteers in the program have either an assigned student leader board member or a community lead that serves as their point of contact in the program. On the other hand, unit mentors are another leadership position with, within our program. Mentors are expert volunteers within their respective units who have demonstrated reliability, good communication skills, and a strong record of service with us. Mentors are selected by joint decisions between the student leader board member and their staff volunteer supervisor on the unit via a formal application process. And the mentors are to serve on a semester basis. Due to the wide variety and functions within each unit, mentor roles can change from one unit to the next. Oftentimes, mentor duties involve working one-on-one -on -one to train new volunteers to the unit, answering volunteer questions, orienting volunteers to the hospital layout, demonstrating successful patient interaction and visiting skills, and providing the SLB feedback about the unit. Mentors play a vital role within our program. I'm sure there are some future, future mentors and student leader board members watching this right now. As the case of the student leader board applications and the mentor applications, they are available on our website along with more information about these leadership roles. If you have questions or are interested, um, please feel free to contact your SLB coordinator or our office. If you have any questions, please go back and read through communications you have received through the Volunteer Services Office, then check the Volunteer Handbook for the answer. If you are still unsure, you can reply to your last email or email the volunteer services at uiowa.edu directly. So now that we have covered a little bit more about our program, this is a great breaking point for those who would like to watch this video in segments. Our next session will cover confidentiality and patient privacy. Now that you have all the information about our volunteer program, we'll move on to confidentiality and patient privacy. Protecting privacy can take many forms. Simply the fact that someone is a patient here is an issue of confidentiality and you are responsible for ma maintaining it as a volunteer. During your time at UIHC, you may hear more about the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, commonly referred to as HIPAA. This is a federal regulation enacted to enhance the security and privacy of protected health information. HIPAA designates civil and criminal penalties to be imposed for confidentiality breaches, which means you personally can be held responsible and fined if you share protected health information outside of what is required to perform your volunteer duties here. Fines up to $50,000 have been issued in the past. We want you to understand just how valued this information is. Most potential volunteers have a good understanding that any health information you come across here at the hospital, say from filling charts or working in clinics, is private and should not be discussed outside of what is required to perform your volunteer assignment. But let's just say you're out delivering flowers one afternoon and have an arrangement sent to the coach of one of our sports team or some other public figure. Obviously, that's pretty exciting. And the first thing you want to do is tell a friend who you delivered flowers to that day or post it on Facebook. But would that be appropriate? Protecting the confidentiality of our patients means that we keep both keep private both specific information and the fact that they are patients here. Protecting confidentiality can be as simple as turning a chart upside down during transport so the patient's name is not visible. Protecting patient confidentiality is very important and is something that hospital volunteers need to be thinking about all the time. The term PHI is, free, is used frequently in HIPAA and is a term that you should become familiar with. PHI refers to protected health information. That is private information that you see, hear, or say must be kept confidential and can only be used or disclosed for specific purposes related to a patient's treatment and payment or the operations of the healthcare organization. Anything that can be used to identify a patient that relates to their health information qualifies it to PHI. Examples of PHI are listed here. As you can see, even a patient's name is individually identifiable and therefore protected under HIPAA. 
Please review the University of Iowa Healthcare Privacy Notice linked in the volunteer handbook before you return to volunteer at our hospital. This brochure is given to all patients at our institution and reviews our policies on the uses of protected health information and patients' rights. It, is also, it also offers contact information for questions or complaints regarding these issues. Now, I realize that we've been talking quite a bit about confidentiality, and I hope you can appreciate why. But a few simple reminders can go a long way. So how does this specifically apply to you? First, only access to patient's information if you need it to do your job. Second, never share a patient's information with others unless it is necessary for your job. This means not talking about a patient with friends outside the hospital or with other volunteers or with anyone unless absolutely necessary to perform your volunteer duties. Finally, never put any protected health information in a trash can. Even if a piece of paper contains one patient's name, it is protected health information and needs to go in a confidential container for shredding, not just the ordinary trash can. Protecting patient confidentiality is one of your most important responsibilities as a volunteer here. If you have any questions, please ask the student leader board member for your unit, any member of the volunteer services staff, or your volunteer supervisor. Please remember that PHI does not have to be written material. It can be a photograph posted on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or other social media sites, which leads me to our technology guidelines. To, to maintain a professional environment, the use of personal cell phones is prohibited while volunteering at our hospital. Turn it off, or even better, leave it in your bag so you are not tempted. This restriction also helps us to remember not to take photos of patients, as this would be, of course, another type of individually identifiable protected health information. Do not post information about patients on social media websites whatsoever. Remember the volunteer mantra, what you see here, what you hear here must remain here when you leave here. I think you might be muted. I'm gonna take myself off mute first. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm gonna jump in here real quick and add, um, uh, you know, we hope that you guys are going to have, we, we expect you guys are going to have awesome interactions um, and experiences here at the hospital that you're going to want to share with your friends and family. Um, and and this privacy piece is, is really important, um, but it doesn't prevent you from sharing your stories, right? You just need, we, we sometimes talk about scrubbing your story, right? So so when you're talking to um, your, your friends and family about your experiences here, you just need to be sure that you're removing all of the PHI, right? Anything that could potentially identify the patient. Um, and, and one example I, I would use is just imagine if, if you're, if you're telling the story, um, uh, about your experience and one of the patient's family members were within earshot, could they identify if you were talking about their, you know, their family member by the details that you shared? And if you think they could, then you might be, you, you need to scrub your story a little bit more, right? So when I go home and, and share about my experiences, um, I, I'm just going to be sure that I'm not mentioning, you know, names or even sometimes it's conditions, right? So we have some patients that um, maybe they were in, involved in an accident that was in the news that was widely covered, um, or maybe they're having a procedure done that's cutting edge, right? And, and maybe they're the only patient that's having that procedure, one of the first. And if I would share that information, that's also potentially personally identifiable, right? So, so just a few examples of um, things that, um, again, can help you to um, think about PHI in, in a little bit different way. I don't know, Megan, maybe you have some other examples of situations that you've encountered, but. I don't think I have examples specifically, but I just think being cognizant about your time here and what you share is just something to keep in mind as a volunteer and always important, like we've talked about in the last couple of slides. So I think you echoed that well. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> I need to address hospital safety and standard precautions. There is more specific information in your handbook and additional information is provided when you have your position specific training. But today I wanted to especially point out, remember to always wear your photo ID badge. As the numbers to dial within the hospital code for code blue, code green and fire right on the back, as you can see here. 
So do not call 911 if you are in the hospital. It is faster and safer to use a house phone and dial the extensions on the back of your ID badge instead. Safety reference cards, which offer even more detail about safety issues, can be found in the volunteer handbook and are available in the volunteer services office and in your binders at your work sites. So, <laughs> so standard precautions are a set of precautions that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has called for to minimize the risk that healthcare workers will catch an infection from a patient or spread infection among patients. Standard precautions cover blood or any bodily fluids. They must be observed with all patients at all times, regardless of age, gender, diagnosis, or whether they are under isolation for a specific disease. A good rule of thumb that we like to say, if it's wet and it's human, don't touch it. You should practice standard precautions before and after each patient contact. One thing we say is foam in, foam out, when referring to hand sanitizer gel pumps located outside each patient room. These are all the times when you should perform hand hygiene. Please remember that every time you cross the threshold of an inpatient room, you need to sanitize your hands. Just remember the phrase, like we said before, foam in, foam out. In addition to using hand sanitizer, you should be washing your hands. It may seem like a simple thing, but hand washing is the best way to protect yourself and others in the hospital. You should wash your hands with warm water and soap before and after all patient contact. Jean is going to do a little demonstration for us. Because my demo is a lot shorter than the videos. <laughs> but we do um, want to talk about just what those motions look like, what that um, what, what that practice should be. And the first uh, um, thing to chat about is how long do you need to wash your hands to, to um, be effective? Uh, and everybody have a guess in their head? Megan, do you have a guess in your head? Um, I would say about 30 seconds. 30 seconds, that would be perfect. Ne never less than 15, we'd say 20 to 30 seconds. Um, and, and that's not like scrubbing you into surgery kind of hand hygiene. That's just general everyday day to day. I feel like a lot of us are, you know, much better at that after COVID or during COVID. And maybe those habits have kind of slid again, depending on where you're at and what you're doing. But um, when you're back in healthcare, uh, 20 seconds is minimum. And and there are a lot of little tricks to help us remember how long 20 seconds really is, because it's longer than you think, if you're not already in that habit. Um, and I know I use the ABC song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way through next time. Won't you sing with me? Megan, you have a you have a trick or a tip? Um, my favorite is happy birthday, going through happy birthday twice. I do that twice, yeah, to get to that 20 second or more. And they're little twinkle, twinkle, little star. I know people, mm -hmm. use, some people count it out. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. I have a second hand. You have a Fitbit probably. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or watch or whatever. There you go. Um, so there's lots of different ways, but the important thing is consistently don't, it's, it's easy to cut it short. Um, you're, you're starting out all your new, good, new volunteer habits and, and um, hand hygiene for the proper length of time is one of them. So do you want to help me count out? Um, I would love to. <laughs> I'll do the demo. So you're going to use the warmest water that's comfortable for you. Wet your hands, a pump of foaming hand wash. And then you just need to be sure that you're getting all of the surfaces, right? So the backs of your hands, underneath your nails, your nail beds, right? Your wrist area, your thumbs, all of those. All, all right, of those. you're halfway. <laughs> halfway. Gosh, Megan, that's forever. <laughs> Clean all the germs off. <laughs> I know, I know, right? So again, where where those um, crevices and nail beds are, you want to pay special attention. All right. Now? Time's up, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think the point is longer than you realize um, and, and habits are, are important. And you're, and you're responsible, right, to, to be accountable for that. Um, we do have secret shoppers, right, that make sure that we are following those, those guidelines. Um, and if you're observed not following those um, uh, important, uh, um, again, um, actions, whether it's hand washing or, or more often probably the hand sani at the door, um, that can be reason for removing you from a patient, uh, drug patient uh, facing volunteer placement here. It's, it's a super serious responsibility. Those, the motions that I just showed are the same, whether you're washing your hands with soap and water, um, or if you're using that foaming sanitizer, right? It's just a lot quicker with the sanitizer. As long as you get those surfaces wet, 
um, when when you're dry, you're you're good to go. So you don't have to continue with the motions. You get all of those surfaces damp with the hand sani when you're dry. Um, you're good to go. And there, there'll be more information uh, when you have your unit trainings, right? As far as what, what you know, the, the, the where and the why on your particular area. Um, and if you have any questions, ask. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for you to um, uh, experience getting, getting going here um, with mentors and student leader board members and staff volunteer supervisors and other volunteers. And um, so this is this is just kind of the introduction piece. So as we continue, um, these are currently the isolation and infection control signs that we utilize um, at a number of units at UIHC. They may look different when you get started volunteering, so make sure that you remember and refer to the information presented at your unit specific training, which is important. So these signs identify what measures need to be taken. To I'm just going to add to and in the handbook because <laughs> right during COVID, we did have a lot of changes and your mm -hmm. handbook is always your go to resource for what's current. Absolutely true. And so these signs identify what measures need to be taken um, to decrease the risk of spreading germs when patients are either suspected or known carriers of contagious germs. So what you always need to remember is stop before entering a patient's room and read what is posted on the door first. It is your responsibility to watch for these signs. Then only enter the room if you are trained to do so and you understand the noted precautions on the door. Note that gloves count as PPE and you need to be trained on how to safely put on and remove them if it's needed for your unit. So I want to remind you of our volunteer guidelines and talk about tasks that volunteers should avoid doing. Please never give a patient medication under any circumstances, give food or fluid, even water, to a patient without checking with the nurse on duty first, push a patient on a cart, turn a patient in bed, or remove a patient from a bed, unless you have been trained and are assisting a staff member in these tasks. Take a patient off a nursing unit without permission from the nurse's station. Come to the hospital if you have a cold, rash, or infection. And we'd, we'd add there to 24 hours fever-free without fever-reducing meds. So at this time, it is a great opportunity to take a break. Next, we will cover volunteer performance expectations and conduct. So now we are going to discuss volunteer performance expectations and conduct. Please review the professional appearance policy in the final pages of your volunteer handbook. We ask that you wear a uniform while you volunteer. The most popular uniform choices with students tend to be polos with khaki pants. Furthermore, no denim or fleece of any color is permitted to be worn by staff and volunteers. However, if you're, you are more than welcome to wear long sleeves underneath your polo or a cardigan as long as the logo is visible on said polo. Polos are for sale during regular business hours in the Wild Rose gift shop for $28. Before you purchase, however, check with your SLB to see what is required in your unit. The hospital is utilizing color-coded scrubs to help patients identify members of their healthcare team, and volunteers in a volunteer polo serve that same purpose, along with your badge, which will help identify you as a volunteer. Thanks, Megan. Um, our hospitals nationally recognized, right, for excellent clinical quality and uh, innovative medical expertise. In addition to our medical competency, it's important for us to be known for our courtesy and compassion. All of our staff and volunteers must be focused on customer service and recognize the important role you play in the patient and family experience. In order to take these efforts, um, one step further, uh, we, we are really focusing on our service excellence program um, uh, and the personal relationships that you'll all have the opportunity to cultivate while our, you're on duty here. The attention that we pay to our environment, how does it look, how does it feel, how's it, is, how's it smell, right? I mean, the flow of our processes, all of these things impact the patient uh, perception and patient experience. So another way to look at that is um, focusing on the purpose, not the task, right? Um, 
we, we think about uh, an example that I like to use is a, a lot of our inpatient unit volunteers are uh, responsible for stocking inpatient rooms, right? That's the task. The purpose really is to get you into that patient care environment and help you have interactions, right? So, so the purpose is um, hi, my, you know, introducing yourself, chatting with that patient while while you're in the care environment, and maybe even telling them, you know, talking to them about what you're doing when you enter the room and you're using the hand sanitizer showing those motions so that they have the perception that you are following the same safety guidelines as all of the care team. Um, again, talking through why you're stocking the room um, and then and then using that uh, to leverage to leverage a, a conversation with a patient. And that's that's really the purpose, right? To help them have a perception of being cared for. And I think it's easy, whether you're a staff member or a volunteer, um, to get focused on the task, especially if it's if it's a busy day and you know that you have a lot to do. Um, but remember to take the time um, for our patients and family members, and that the real the real point is um, that patient rapport that that you're going to have the chance to to practice um, building while you're here. Um, as a volunteer, we always can encourage you to ask, is there anything else I can do for you? I have the time. That's a great, uh, great interaction to, to keep in mind. And keep your eyes open, right, to the opportunities to connect and engage that are going to be um, all around you here at the hospital, um, but maybe outside of your general unit description. Um, so some of the ways that you are going to have that opportunity listed on, on the slide here, wayfinding. I, I can't um, overestimate how important um, and how valuable and how rewarding it can be to help um, walk patients um, to their appointments, escort them um, to their destination. I've had a lot of different volunteering experiences here, um, and, and a lot of the stories that come to mind were you know, not actually part of my duty, but as part of the um, helping in the hallways uh, that that we all can can uh, support here. And I get that when you're new, um, it can be just as intimidating to find your way from point A to point B as a volunteer as it might be a patient. But um, knowing where everything is is not the most important piece. Um, being open and and sharing a smile and starting that interaction, I would say, um, it is 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 much more important than actually having the entire facility under your belt. Um, <laughs> dialing one hundred and one from a house phone is one of my um, best kept secrets. I would say here, uh, any phone that you pick up here and dial one hundred and one, you're going to be connected to the uh, info desk folks who. Um, are able to help direct you. You can get information if you're trying to direct a patient. They can tell you, you know, the inpatient location, or even for if you're helping to direct folks going to a clinic, or maybe they're not sure what clinic they're going to. If they don't have their patient letter with them, the folks answering that 101 phone line can look them up and give you good guidance on how to get them to where they next need to be. Um, and not super convenient usually, but we do have three information desks and I encourage you spend a little bit of time as you're getting started um, as a volunteer because those information desks have great resources at them. So it's good for you to know where they are and you're always welcome to take patients or family members there, um, but oftentimes it's not going to be um, physically convenient. But if you know the resources that are there, there's a, a ton of great information on our amenities and, um, and uh, just everything that's available here to improve the patient family experience at those information desks. And I'd love to just add, um, I usually say that when somebody is looking lost, you may not know exactly where they're going, um, but I always love to say, let's find out together. Um, it's just something that's comforting to patients and families. Um, you're just an integrated part of, the, part of the team. And I think it's just one more step that we can use to get the perception that we always want to help volunteers and patients. And families. So something to keep in mind. That's, that's a great, um, great suggestion. And I do think, you know, a lot of times I'll go up and offer, can I help you find something? And if people don't want to be a burden, right? People don't want to be a burden. So think of the ways that we can make it easier for them to uh, um, feel comfortable having some support. So a lot of times, instead of, can I help you find the, you know, whatever clinic, it's, oh, you know, I'm going that way anyway. Do you mind if I walk with you? 
feels, you know, just, just that little bit of a, um, um, then, then it kind of is, well, how do you not, I'm not a burden, right? I'm not going to be rude and tell them no, but just those little different um, pivots can help that individual to feel, um, again, not that they're lost or not that they're a burden, but that um, everybody here is friendly, just like the place they probably left home from this morning. Uh, we're we're a big facility, and and I think that that can be intimidating. Um, and and you guys are going to have the opportunity to just bring it right back to that just as friendly as as the town they left that morning um i think our next slide um it, it, it related right keeping in mind um many of our patients come from across the state of iowa um many don't take elevators um on a day-to-day -day basis um they may be tired, they may be worried, um, simply stressed out from the environment. And, and I think it's easy in Iowa City, we take for granted uh, things like the traffic and parking ramps and elevators, but those aren't everyday things for most Iowans, right? Um, and, and I think that uh, I, I consider the elevators one of our great opportunities to, to break the ice. Um, most people are a little bit uncomfortable in an elevator and we're all going to be in there for a few seconds <laughs> together. So um, uh, a, a great a great opportunity to share a friendly smile, look those folks in the eye, um, say hello, just make a point of making contact um, when you walk in. Um, and I think spending a little time, right, this segment is really kind of helping to prepare you, get your mind into um, what it's going to be like to, to be here and for you to be ready to initiate interactions um, um, and, and also to close them. We'll talk about that in a minute so that you're comfortable and, and can be your most authentic, outgoing self, right? Be, be the one to start those, those contacts here and be ready to do that. And I don't like necessarily scripting things, but I do have some examples of things that um, I, I like to use that are comfortable for me. Um, you know, many of you may be, you could start up a conversation in any grocery store line, right? But if you haven't been in healthcare before, sometimes it's things that you, that you are used to using out in the community to build rapport aren't going to be as, um, necessarily appropriate here, right? So have a great day. It may not be here, right? You don't know what's going on, on the other side of things. So so be thinking about um, other ways that um, you, you can open and close conversations. I've got a few that are listed here. There's all kinds of them, really. The point is that you're ready, that you're, that you're coming ready to have those interactions. Um, is this your first visit is one of um, the um, questions I like to ask folks uh, on the elevator. I'll do that. Um, I think it's helpful um, for, for me to hear where they're coming from, right? The answer to that question will be probably very telling. So if it's their first visit, I'm, I'm going to go with them no matter what, right? I'm going to walk with them. That first visit, I mean, that can really be um, impactful and maybe especially um, anxious for them. Um, and I think if they tell me, oh, no, I, you know, we've been here three weeks, that, that helps me to know where they're coming from too, right? So then sometimes my challenge is going to be, well, if they're a frequent flyer, I wonder if I can come up with an amenity or a resource that they didn't know about yet. Oh, have you been up to the patient's library? Um, if they're if there's kids there, you know, I'm going to be like, did you know that if you go up to the eighth floor by elevator F, you can see the helicopters coming, in, you know, landing or or the for real machine and the cafeteria that makes the, you know, I, I have all my little kind of wows. And, and these questions that I'm suggesting here kind of help help to get me to what's going to be most helpful in a very quick conversation. Um, with a patient or family member. So the next one I have listed here, are you from around here? 
that's an easy uh, uh, Iowa uh, Midwestern kind of question. And it also gives me insight, right? So if they tell me the name of some little, no, I'm from, and it's a town I've never heard of in all these years, again, I'm, I'm probably going to stick with them a little bit more closely because if they come from a small town from a ways away, this could be a, a much more stressful um, visit than if they answer, oh, no, yeah, I'm just from Coralville here. I, I come here all the time, right? Um, just, just helps me kind of understand where they're coming from. And like I mentioned, I think the closers can be just as important because it's not going to be, um, you know, get well soon or, or have, have a nice day. Um, you, you don't know what they're going through. And, and so you want to have comfortable things ready to, to, to close a conversation with quickly again. I hope things go well for you. Um, I, a lot of times I use take care, um, so, so again, it's not not right or wrong, but just just to get you thinking about what's what's comfortable for you, and and to have you be prepared to 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 initiate successful interactions here. Yeah, so um, you're going to have a lot of opportunities, right, to connect with patients. Um, within your role um, and, and in your, your assigned area. We, we use a, a greeting here, um, the Iowa greeting, and we encourage you to use that with every single interaction that you have. Um, and it was really, uh, I guess you'd call it kind of crowdsourced. We asked, what can we do um, to, to make this a more comfortable, welcoming environment? And the the responses that we got from our staff and volunteers at that time were, were really the nod and the thanks. Um, uh, acknowledge and greet. So hi, hello. The first thing that we should be um, saying is, is, again, that proactive, initiate the interaction. Name, my name's Jean, occupation, I'm a volunteer. Then duty, task, what brings you into that care environment? So I'm a volunteer. I'm here to deliver your patient mail. I'm here to stock supplies in your room today. Whatever it is um, uh, that, that or, or maybe I'm just, I'm here to see if there's anything I can do to be helpful. Um, and, and then the, the, the closer, um, is there anything else I can do for you? And I mentioned before, we encourage our volunteers to add to that. I have the time because I think you'll find that there are a lot of patients um, and family members who, it's a busy environment here. Again, nobody wants to be a bother. Nobody wants to be a burden. People have a lot of respect for our uh, busy staff members and maybe are, are not wanting to um, ask for things that would help them to feel comfortable um, because they have so much respect for the important work that the team's doing here. So it, you can just add that. Um, I've got the time. Is there anything else I can do? You may be surprised at the simple things um, that, you know, a, a person who is um, in, in a hospital bed uh, can't be as independent um, and, and grabbing glasses or uh, uh, the phone that's out of reach. Very simple environmental things can, can make a big difference. So is there anything else I can do for you? I have the time. And then the closer of uh, a nod and a thanks is a thank you. And, and I feel like sometimes that's the part that's least comfortable for volunteers. And, and I think it's a little bit of a perspective that, oh, you know, I, I think they usually thank me. <laughs> which is probably true. Um, but the thank you, you'll hear a care provider say, you know, thanks for allowing me to care for you today or, or thank you for choosing UI Healthcare. Um, I think, so I, I volunteer. And, and when, I, when I leave a room, I, I mean, it, it's, it's a privilege, right? To, to, to be in a care environment with a patient. And I, I sincerely believe, you know, thank you for letting me visit with you today um, is, 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 I feel that in my heart, right? It's, it's a very rewarding experience for me. And I think that thank you is a really nice closer. Usually they do say, well, thank you and, and allows them to share appreciation. But um, I, I think that if you, if you give it a try, it feels more natural than um, just reading it on the page. And it also is a nice closing um, to, to those interactions. You have anything you want to add there, Megan? 
Um, I don't think anything specific. I always like to say um, to patients, if they're a little hesitant, if when I say like, is there anything else that I can do for you? I always said, please, I would love to help. Like, I would love to help you. I'd love to do anything. I just think it's a little nudge in the right direction if they are afraid to kind of approach you. So something to think about. That's great. So the next slide, I think there are a lot of things that you can do for the patient when asked. Um, sometimes it can be intimidating, right? Uh, if you see a call light lit, sometimes people feel like, well, that means they need the nurse. And I'm not a nurse. <laughs> um, but most of the call light activations are for are for environmental things, very simple things that volunteers um, can assist with. And again, this is review from the handbook, but um, quick, easy things, moving the call light, the bedside table, the telephone, um, the trash. Again, eyeglasses or other personal items can get out of reach easily if you're not able to ambulate and get up on your own. Um, help to answer the phone, adjusting the lights. The TV is kind of complicated here, helping people to get where they want to be with that. Um, and then other items that you can get for comfort care, warm blankets, um, check with the nurse first, of course, for those types of things, but pillows, towels, pencil paper, magazine, patient's library, all kinds of things. Um, open and closing the room curtains or privacy curtains. I know when I leave a room, I always ask, would you like the door open or closed, right? Those kinds of things. When you're in a situation where you don't have a lot of control, those kinds of things can help you feel like, yes, you do get to pick, right? There are things that that are in your control and there are things that volunteers can help to make easier um, during during your visit. Yeah, next steps already. So we've reviewed some of the basic information that you need as a new volunteer. Um, and now we're going to cover, cover some of the next steps. And again, a lot of this was just helping helping to get you ready for this next step, get your mind in the game, help you to prepare to come back on site and be, be successful. Um, I think keeping communication open um, with, with the volunteer services office right now, right? It's a lot of the stuff is back and forth with, with email moving you through our onboarding process. And, and don't be um, intimidated that... Um, to, to reply to those email messages. I think sometimes people feel like, oh, these are automated messages. Uh, volunteer services staff, paid staff, read every uh, email that comes through both our visas and volunteer services email accounts. And that is the best way to get timely um, responses, especially if you're not sure where you are in the process or if you thought you might hear by now. We mentioned on this slide here, reach back out. If you haven't heard from our office in five days, That's there's nothing that should take that long. Right, almost everything would be um, two or three days, and and really being on top of your email um, and going back and referring to the the last communication that you have from our office that will go a long way. But like I say, other folks that are here to help too, your staff, volunteer supervisors, student leader board members, community leads, all wonderful contacts. Um, I know many of you still have compliances, right? That you that you need to work through, um, and I, I think that especially for our student volunteers that are that are watching these videos right now, we really have um, uh, progress gives you priority, right? So we encourage everybody to get through these steps as quickly as you can, um, and if you have, um, and and again, the students are especially are have a timeline and are are going to be rewarded by moving quickly as quickly as possible through these steps. But it's true for community volunteers too, right? Those timelines keep those steps in mind, and if you have questions or concerns, absolutely reach out. A reliable weekly record is dependent upon open communication with staff um, and, and reliable weekly service. A, a reminder when you have uh, here on the slide, it says minimum of two semesters and 72 hours total for our community volunteers. It's a six month commitment, right, to weekly service, but it's the same 72 total hours as the minimum commitment. Um, unit attendance policies differ, right? So some of you are going to be serving in areas where they they have more flexibility with those shifts, or they they host makeup schedules. Um, every every unit's different. You're going to work with your leadership to uh, identify how your absences need to be reported and how they can be made up. 
Um, we can do um, letters of recommendation, right? So if you've served 40 or more hours of your volunteering commitment, we can provide you with hours confirmation. So some of you may need that for applications, classes, or other activities. And then after you've met that minimum 72-hour commitment, a personalized letter of recommendation can be requested from our office. Um, you need to be recording your hours, right? That's on the slide there too, that you are responsible for that. And even if your hours aren't important to you, I hear that sometimes volunteers are like, I'm not doing it for the hours. I'm like, we, we know you're not doing it for the hours. That, that's The hours are how we track, right? The It's the only way that we can measure really to, to leadership, to unit administration, the 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 tremendous impact that you all are out there making. Um, it's also how we keep track for compliances as those hours reports that you submit. Um, and, and if we do recommendations or letters, or again, for returning volunteers, priority for placement at, at our uh, returning referral sessions. So it, it, it's one of, uh, one of your top priority responsibilities, I'd say. And I think, um, your reliability is what supports all of all of our partnerships across the house, right? So the more reliable our volunteer team is, the the more responsibilities our staff are are able to um, share with you. The the more um, our partnerships are valued. Um, so so there's there's a lot of paying that forward. I feel like. Um, and it's one of the reasons, you know, why all the onboarding and the and the steps that you take, we are really, you are, you're going through a process very similar to what staff or faculty have for patient interaction. And, and it's a privilege to serve here, right? Um, we're super excited to get you, get you going. Talking a little bit about first choices. So, so next steps, right? I, I know some of the feedback that we get after people watch these videos is, I wish I had more information about what the um, service choices are, right? And so community volunteers are going to get uh, exposure to that when they start doing their hours out of the, the office here and we'll mentor with in different areas and look through our position description book. And for the student volunteers, there'll be a video that um, after, closer to the information session time that you'll be able to go and, and um, hear the student leader board members um, actually give information, specific information about the units that they're recruiting for that you'll you'll be choosing from. Um, and there'll be information on that website as well as um, the mandatory unit training time. So, so all that information is yet to come in this onboarding. Um, we, we, it's not something that we covered today. I think about today is really what does everybody need to know to be safe, um, to get them on the right first step to being a successful volunteer here, whether they're going to be placed in the in the Wild Rose Gifts or the, the Bone Marrow Transplant Unit, right? Totally different, totally different kinds of service. Those, those gift shop volunteers have, you know, cash handling and all different kinds of trainings, unit specific training information. And on our bone marrow transplant unit, right? All the isolation and infection control things that are specific to those, that all happens going forward. Um, right now, it's really, what does everybody need to know to be, to come back and be confident and, and ready to have those positive um, experiences with patients and families? Um, recording hours, again, that will also be talked about at your unit trainings. Anything else, Megan, you think we want to mention? I don't think so. I think that was pretty well covered. <laughs> okay. I know you moved <laughs> to that last slide, and I do love that last slide, right? Yeah. You should go for that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so finally, I would like to close with a quote from one of our team members, Peaches Witch. I think she really cut to the chase when she said, and remember that whatever your volunteer role at the hospital, every day you will have the opportunity to make a difference for our patients and their families and for each other. Thank you so much for watching, and we look forward to helping you make a difference at volunteering at UIHC Hospitals and Clinics.